Welcome to the 2023 Hanhill Bleachard Uncommon Artist Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us uh, across time zones today for what promises to be an exciting program. Please know that uh, enclosed captioning in English is available today by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. I'm Mathilde walker Bio, Creator of Programming at the American Folk Art Museum. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from and our museum stands upon Lenape Hawking, the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware peoples. We honor Lenape people, past, present, and future, and are committed to centering indigenous perspectives in exhibitions and programs at the museum. As many of you know, the American Folk Art Museum is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught artists across time and place. And we are thrilled to present a new edition of the Han Hill Blanchard and Common Artist Lecture. This annual program highlights new and important contributions to the field of folk and self-taught art. This year's program brings historians and curators together to explore heritage as a tool for innovation and resistance. This lecture uh, will highlight artists and practitioners who are both guardians and pioneers who combine past and present times, Western and non-Western aesthetics to break stereotypes and break with expectations. So we have a very rich and exciting program ahead of us. And uh, starting with historian Jason Jung on David Drake's poetic ceramic practice. Then we will hear uh, historian Philippe Deloria on Mary Surley's Dakota modernism. Art historian and activist Timea Junghaus will close the program with new approaches to Steya Stoiska's visual language. There will be a short Q&A after each speaker's presentation and a final conversation with everyone at the end of the program. So we invite you to, to share your questions throughout the talks using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we really look forward to what you have to contribute. I will introduce uh, all our speakers so we have a sense of the program ahead of us. And I will be also using the chat room just to share more details about the program and the schedule and also share the biographies of the speakers. We are grateful for opportunities like this one to connect online, uh, which will not be possible without the National Endowment for the Humanities and for all of you. Also, uh, today's lecture is being recorded and will be published online later next week. I would like to thank our IT director, Richard Ho, for his technical support today, as well as Rachel Rosen, our Director of Learning and Engagement, and Valérie Rousseau, our Curatorial Chair for Exhibitions and Senior Curator, who are behind the scene today, but were very much involved in the making of this program. So thanks to all, and thank you also, everyone, for being with us. Before introducing our speaker, it's my pleasure an honor to invite our Chair of Board of Trustees, Monty Blanchard, to make a few remarks about the history of this important lecture series. So please welcome Monty Blanchard. Hello. I'm pleased to be able to address you all today briefly. Um, the Uncommon Artist series has always been dear to my late wife's and my interests in this field. And we were pleased to be able to uh, designate this as the Ann Hill Blanchard Uncommon Artist Series. She was the chair of the education committee as a trustee of the American Folk Art Museum. And I know she would be uh, proud and pleased to be part of the presentations that we're going to have today. I'm excited about this proposal, this webinar today because we have the chance to hear Jason Young, Philip Deloria, and Timea Junghaus give us unique insights into the work of David Drake, Mary Sully, and Shea Stoika, three fantastic artists from underappreciated and marginalized or marginalized communities who deserve rigorous appreciation and the forms of scholarship that you'll be hearing today. 
from the point of view of the American Folk Art Museum, I am grateful that this forum has enabled us to extend our reach around the world and that you all can share with this in this exciting webinar with us today. Thank you all very much for your support and appreciation of the American Folk Art Museum. Thank you, Monty, to setting the tone for today's program. Um, so we will begin by the lecture by hearing uh, 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 Jason Young and David Drake, um, uh, enslaved poeter and poet from the 19th century. Jason will highlight the artistic, spiritual, and political meanings of Drake's ceramics practice. So uh, let me just say a few words about Jason Young. Uh, Dr. Jason Young uh, is an associate professor of history at the University of Michigan. He's the author of Rituals of Resistance, African Atlantic Religion in Congo and the Low Country Region of Georgia and South Carolina in the era of slavery. And co-curator of Hear Me Now, the Black Potters of Old Age Field, South Carolina, an exhibition which was on view at the Met last fall. So please welcome Jason Young. Hi, Jason. So good to see you. I just want to start by saying thank you and Thank you for thinking of me both um, in our conversations until that started to think in New York and have continued into this place. I want to thank you and the museum also for having me here. I'm really happy to share um, a few ideas. And I'll start by sharing my screen. And we're off. Um, so yes, my... Um, most recent interaction with this material and with, with Dave the Potter emerges from some curatorial work that I've been doing um, with the larger body of uh, pottery traditions that come out of Edgefield, South Carolina. And though I'm standing here in front of you in a side of a little box that's inside of another little box, I think it's important to, to note that from the very beginning, the curatorial approach that we've had to this show has been about making connections and working collaboratively. You see on the screen uh, in front of you, Adrian Spinozzi uh, to the left uh, from the, the Met Museum and um, Ethan Lasser from the MFA Boston, who is um, has been quite excited about, as you can see, the, the show has, has moved from the Met and is just now this weekend opened up at, at the MFA. So it's a fantastic time to, to consider these questions. Um, but from the very beginning, we have approached this material and this tradition and, and Dave the Potter from a standpoint of collaboration. And that collaboration has meant not only kind of curatorial or, or scholarly collaboration, but it's also involved collaboration with the local communities. Um, we took several trips to Edgefield, South Carolina. We are standing here um, just in front of a, a church graveyard associated with Springfield Baptist Church, which is the church that we um, believe Dave attended when he was um, when he was living in Edgefield. And so from the very beginning, we've been engaged with um, community activists, with artists, and trying to build our understanding of this material, but also trying intentionally to disperse and diffuse any sense of authority or knowledge or know-how around this project and to share that authority with the largest possible groups of people. That process has extended also into um, our larger curatorial vision in which we've invited people from a range of backgrounds, uh, museum curators, artists, activists, makers, anthropologists, to help us consider, interpret, analyze, and come to terms with all of this material. I say this, this as a gesture of, of thanksgiving and gratitude, and I do mean it as a gesture of thanksgiving and gratitude for the people, all of the people who are involved in the work of thinking through this fantastic, difficult, messy material. But I mean it not only as a, as a gesture of gratitude, I mean it also as a kind of ethical statement that even though we're talking um, about individual artists, I think there's something about Dave the Potter in particular, and perhaps some of the other people who 
we'll hear about today, there's something about them that resists the idea of them as singular masterminds and hands. That in the case of Dave the Potter, he was himself deeply involved and engaged in community. And his work is a reflection of his own magnificent um, abilities, which, which really cannot be denied, but they're also a reflection of the community that produced him and that produced that knowledge and that genius. And so if, from a curatorial standpoint, we've been really interested in bringing as many people around the table as possible, I think that's a kind of ethical statement about what it means to do this kind of art in the first place, because although we might highlight individuals, we know that these individuals are, are connected to and through communities. I'll give a brief um, outlook of, of what we are going to be doing today. I'm, I'm interested in various, um, various iterations of the Black body as it relates to Dave the Potter and as it relates to the larger ceramic tradition from which he's, um, he derives. So let's get started. You know, I think that we we often, as it relates to pottery, we often have a way of connecting pottery to its kind of human corporality that that we we imagine and use language, human anthrop anthropomorphic language to describe pottery. We we refer to the mouth of the pot. We talk about the lips, the shoulder, the feet of of pottery, and in this linguistic practice. In some ways, the, the, the pottery emerges as a metaphorical person. The idea of pottery as personified and embodied is elaborated even further when, when the objects under consideration maintain or, or have some anthropomorphic um, features. We'll see some examples of that uh, later today. And here in those instances where the, where the pot um, also maintains or contains certain anthropomorphic um, features, there's an interesting kind of double entendre that emerges where the pot emerges as an object that has both lips and lips and a mouth and a mouth, hair and hair. We'll, we'll certainly see that in some cases um, later today. With these linguistic and, and formal connections in mind, it's no wonder that some scholars have thought about the idea that, that potters themselves see clay as a sort of mirror as a kind of reflection of their humanity. And, and their exploit of its plastic nature is meant in part to signify something about the changing nature of the human experience. But those ideas of, of metaphorical or symbolic corporality, symbolic um, anthropomorphic features that, that we often attach to pottery, those, those symbols are reflected even more when the objects that are under our consideration actually bear the, the imprint. When they bear the handprint, when they when they have impressions that can be seen, when when in the case of Edgefield pottery, we imagine we we imagine the hands of the makers, even as we're seeing the hands of the makers in the very objects themselves. And so, in that sense, the ascribing of anatomical terms to reflect these objects has the effect of not just not just drawing on a kind of symbolic or or figurative connection between the ceramic body, the clay body, and the human body, but in some ways it it draws some very important connections to the fragility of both forms. That much like the clay body, so too is the human body fleeting and frail. So too is it resilient. It's it's hardened by the trials of life. Like the human body, the clay body can be broken. It can be cracked. It can be punctured. But with the pottery that emerged in the Edgefield district, there's, there's this other layer that makes the situation all the more complicated, which is the, the fact that this material is also produced under extraordinary systems of coercion so that every time you see a hand or a fingerprint, every time you see an elusive not, notch, a, a fugitive scratch, with every runaway mark, on those pots, there is evidence of a rebel in the form of that indentation, of that impression. And so in that sense, this strikes me as a process that's not that much different from my own historical training, that as an historian, I'm trained to find 
those kind of fugitive traces in the archival record. But this archive in clay has on more than one occasion stopped me in my tracks. On the right of the, the screen here, you see an example of that kind of hand impression of that moment in which someone has immortalized the work of their hands in ways that are still evident. On the left of the screen, you'll see, you're seeing a hand that um, you'll see in another way um, a little bit later. Here we see examples of the kind of pregnant possibilities that are open through the, the process of making and breaking um, clay pots. And part of, the, um, part of the experience, in fact, of engaging with the material from Edgefield is engaging with this experience of, of breaking. Um, the image that you see here emerged from a recent trip that I took to Edgefield where the material of this massive clay, of these massive clay potteries is everywhere evident on the ground and, and really just below the surface. And it's it was incredibly meaningful. And I have to say a kind of um, spiritual communion for me to be so, so closely connected to material that was made in that distant historical past, but that still survives. Um, you know, in, in many ways, when we think about American slavery, we think about the kinds of crops that enslaved people produced, the tobacco, the sugar, the indigo, and the cotton. But all of those materials, all of that material was consumed at the moment of creation. The cotton was worn bare, the tobacco was smoked, the indigo was worn, but this material is something that stays with us. It, it, it's with us like bones. And then that brings us, of course, to, to Dave, who is constructing these massive, brilliant pots, these kind of masterful pots, which on their own, on their own, deserve an incredible amount, all of the attention and admiration and recognition that these pots are getting in the, in the past few years. They deserve all of that. But the brilliance of these pots as objects and forms are highlighted only more so given the fact that Dave the potter is also writing, that he's inscribing these pots with his name, giving them um, the, the mark of his own immortality. One of the things that, that you note in, in these pots and in his inscriptions are these incredible couplet lines in which Dave offers a critical statement that's often and um, regularly attended with a kind of humorous exit. He, he enters, he, he asks us to, to enter into the horrible nature of American slavery in one uh, gesture, I wonder where is all my relations. And in another gesture, he allows us an exit, a kind of human exit out of that friendship to all and every nation. On the right, you get a sense of Dave the Potter as someone who is every much aware of his environments, of the people who are in his community, of their uh, strange peculiarities, of their quirks. Um, and still, you see him as a kind of playful figure. Um, I note that really interesting play on words, peace at the end of the line for a presumptive enslaved, a presumably enslaved person who in the process of, of having some sustenance gets both a peace and some peace in life. At the same time, Dave's production, his writerly production is happening at a time where African-Americans are by law throughout the American South, um, not intended at all to be reading and writing, where they're prohibited from the pen and access to the pen. And that from a legal standpoint, Dave's writing is, it's an impossibility. It's a legal and political impossibility. And while the law imagines that the, that the idea of an enslaved person writing might be attended with great inconveniences, I think it's Dave that is the inconvenience. He, he, he emerges as that inconvenience because he makes statements about the slave system. He makes statements about the world around him. He immortalizes his life and his experiences in ways that are always telling the lie to the American slave system. In that sense, I think it's important to think about Dave and, and his relationship to a larger pottery tradition, but I think it's also important to think of him as connected to a larger literary tradition. 
despite the fact that slave owners and members of the master class wanted to keep enslaved people in their ignorance, to, to keep them in their illiteracy. There is a massive tradition of African-Americans who write against those legal codes and who detail the experiences and, and um, of their own lives. This is true of Harriet Jacobs, an incidence of a slave girl, of Frederick Douglass, of Alauda Equiano. And in each case, each of these figures talks about the moment when they came into an understanding of literacy and came into an understanding of education. For Frederick Douglass, this moment came when his slave mistress, Sophia Auld, took him to um, the library and was kind of teaching him the very rudiments of, of learning uh, to read and write. And Hugh Auld, his master, rushes into the library and um, excoriates his wife, Sophia Auld, in the following lines on the presumption that if you teach an enslaved person how to read, it'll, it'll ruin that person as a slave. And it was that, it was the, the fact of Frederick Douglass hearing Hugh Auld say that to his wife, that, that you will ruin the slave if you, will, if you teach him how to read. It was that moment that encouraged Frederick Douglass to learn how to read. <laughs> he wanted to be ruined as a slave. And so from that moment, he took, uh, he took it upon himself to, uh, to learn to read. And, and in fact, it was his reading and writerly um, um, expertise that, that eventually became the, the source of his freedom, the, the way that he escaped American slavery. In this case, we see Dave again speaking very much in, in connection with a larger literary tradition of African Americans in the 19th century. Some of you may know that January 1st, throughout the American Slave South, January 1st was a day of major slave sales. It was the day that slave owners would hire out enslaved people from one plantation to another. And so it was the day, more than any other day, to be sure, slaves could be bought and sold any day of the year, but January 1st was always understood as a kind of massive day of trade and sale. And so January 1st was this moment of tremendous mourning. So that here's Dave in the early part of December, uh, thinking about these moments that are coming up when January 1st will be upon us and families will be separated. You get much the same conversation happening in the slave narrative tradition um, among African-Americans. Here again, we see another example. This is from Thomas Gray, who was a lawyer in 1830, who, um, like many white Southerners, couldn't imagine that Nat Turner himself <laughs> could decide to, um, to rise up and, and respond violently to the slave system. And so he approached Nat Turner in the final days of his life. Nat Turner was um, led a, a, a massive rebellion in Southamp Southampton County, Virginia. He was eventually captured. He was sentenced to die. And Thomas Gray, in the final moments of, of Nat Turner's life, went to the cell and interviewed him um, in an effort, this is Thomas Gray talking, not me, but an effort to try to find out what had happened to Nat Turner that he became so gloomy and fanatic in his desire to end slavery violently. In this sense, again, it's an idea from the vantage point of the master class that there's something about reading and writing that ruins enslaved people for the experience and, and for the life of a slave. It's not just that um, Dave, Dave's work was consonant, was connected to the literary traditions in which he was operating in the 19th century. The other thing that we see is that he's, he's become an incredibly important um, figure for subsequent contemporary artists who have drawn in various ways on a large tradition, um, a broad tradition of ceramics and ceramic production uh, from this from this region. Here you see um, on the left one of a, a fantastic work uh, by um, Arebumi Badebo, and it's, this is um, an image of her um, on the right, whose own family connections are um, are deeply rooted in South Carolina on True Blue Plantation, which is not far from where Dave would have worked. And she has mined the clay from the very um, family cemetery plots of her own ancestors to create 
much of the work um, that she's been engaged in now so that her work becomes a kind of connection to ancestral um, to her ancestral lives who are themselves returned into the dirt from which she's making this fantastic material. At the same time, Badebo has not only made the work, but, but made the work literary in the ways that she's titled the work and connected it to her own family, um, her own family connections and her own ancestry. So in this sense, um, these works are both physical, artistic works and literary works in much the same way that was true of Dave the Potter. In addition, other contemporary artists have been also inspired by this work to the extent that Dave's um, mastery is rooted at least in part in his ability to create monumental objects. <laughs> Here we have Simone Lee who um, contributes to uh, the show Hear Me Now with a massive monumental jug, which she calls, <laughs> and, and not subtly, large jug, um, making a reference to these large monumental jugs that were happening, that were being produced in, in Edgefield, and a nod to, to Dave the Potter, who is making masterful works on a fantastic scale. It strikes me in that sense, then, that in part, the answer to the question, where is all my relations, is complicated and subtle and, and multivalent in one sense. Dave's relations are comprised of the larger literary tradition in which he was writing in the 19th century. His relations are, are found in contemporary artists who are still making work that, are, that is connected to and, and um, in some sense a kind of communion with the work that Dave the Potter was, was producing. And more than that, um, Dave's relations are in more recent times organizing themselves as a way of creating families and fellowships to, to connect themselves to this history that, um, that is so important to them and, and to their own families. So in that sense, Dave's relations um, move in different directions and I'm happy to, to stop there and then take um, any questions. Thank you so much, Jason, for, for this uh, really, really great um, presentation and also for leading us through the complexities of the work and uh, the new scholarship that you've been leading for the exhibition Hear Me Now. Um, and that's also um, why we were so excited to have you for, for this uh, new, new lecture on um, Uncommon un un Artist as you uh, part, like as David Drake and the Black Potters have, are, have been the subject of new scholarship and research. Um, I would love for you maybe to talk about um, how you, you, you feel like you, you're, you're participating in this new form of scholarship yeah. and, um, and also how does it connect to you to research project on, on religion and folk history? Yeah, I'll say, I'll say there are probably two answers to that. The first is um, in the beginning, I talked about the importance of, of community and coming together, one of the um, significant outcomes of, of this work is that I think increasingly we're in a position to be able to contextualize the work of Dave the Potter alongside and with other African-Americans who are engaged in Edgefield Potteries. Some of those um, figures are named, some of them are unnamed, but I think more importantly, some of them are yet to be named, which is to say, continued research in this field is likely to um, surface more, more um, people, more biographies and things like that. So that's that's one sense that I think that in some, in some ways the focus on Dave the Potter has actually expanded our sense of this massive community of people who are engaged in production. Part of that community, the same communities from which Dave the Potter is, has emerged or was emerging, part of that community was also engaged in the production of ritual objects, ritual ceramic objects that they used in various ways to be sure. But it is at least clear to me that, that some of the uses of those, um, of those ritual project, um, products, those, those face vessels, for example, that came out of Edgefield were, were being used for spiritual purposes and as a, as a part of 
African American folk art and tradition. So in that sense, I think that he is, Dave is in some ways a kind of um, a window into a larger community and a larger community of, of artistic production that's that we're still learning more and more about. Yes, you have the this this um this comment or a reflection in your in your catalog for the essay when you talk about this uh, new scholarship looking at or uh, like making a distinction between objects and things. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. such a such a strong um and powerful distinction in 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 rapport to to the work of of uh, David uh, Drake. So I would love maybe for for you to share that distinction and how it also. Um, help you think and, and approach the work of David Drake? Yeah, I think this is something that's emerging in a number of uh, kind of multidisciplinary fields where there's an emerging distinction happening between what we call objects and what we call things. And, and in this connection, some people have started to argue that to call something a thing rather than an object is to imbue it with certain inanimate or um, spiritual qualities. That, that things arrest our attention, they aspire us to action, um, and they possess their own qualities of agency that things can do um, in the world and not just be acted upon. And so in that sense, we might take, we might think of a whole range of otherwise mundane objects, but when you use those objects as part of a wedding ceremony or as part of a funeral or on the, on the field of battle, those objects become imbued with real significance and power. And I think this is this is part of the experience that I've had working with this larger tradition of ceramic production out of Edgefield, and certainly with the material that Dave produced, is that it affects and arrests me in a way that other otherwise mundane objects don't. Um, and so I've, I've been having some real moments with this material, to be quite honest. And some of those moments have been um, some of those moments have been inspiring and, 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 and awful, not in a bad way, but like full of awe. I don't mean awful in a bad way, but full of awe. Some of those moments have been, um, really debilitating. There've been moments where I've literally been stopped in my tracks on the ground in Edgefield. And that's, that's not me working on the objects. That's the objects working on me. Those, that's the things working on me. Yes, and uh, and also the the you, you mentioned that also during during your talk at, at the Met of how um, this place um, the Old Elfield um, district is full of emotions and spirituality. Um, I, I was kind of fascinated by this this comment of you, and and now also as you you expanding on my questions now how um, you are you know taking into account the emotion which is not something that I feel like it's um, common or uh, in history especially you know I feel like the field is pretty reticent to, mm. to emotion so I just would like to yeah maybe to have you talk about that how you maybe push again that um, so I think I yeah, so there, there's some truth to that right and there is at least in a traditional sense there's this idea that the historian is standing at an objective distance to the thing that they're studying. I've just never done that. And so like I, I've never respected that, that distance. Instead, I have been interested in questions connected to affect and emotion and feeling and sentiment. I've, I've been most comfortable in those environments. And, and I try to be as transparent as possible about how the things um, how the things get into my feelings <laughs> and what that and what that means in terms of my own work now to be fair more recently and depends on how you count but in the in the past few days past few years there's been um whole fields opening up on the on the question of historical affect and so there are plenty of people working now in the question of affect and sentiment and feeling um and those are places where i feel most at home i've never i've never actually trusted or believed in that objective distance. I've 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 never respected it. <laughs> to be honest, I, I probably shouldn't say that in in out loud, but it is true. I've I've always been somewhat um, suspicious of that presumed objective distance. Yes, and and as as you said, it's it's also a very powerful um, research device, like uh, to mm -hmm. take into affections and how it how the past also arrests us in the present. 
Um, also, I am very fascinated by your multidisciplinary approach to, to the work. And as you uh, shown us today, um, looking at the literary, I like how uh, David uh, the Potter, David Drake is also part of a literary um, tradition. I think this is really incredible to see those connections. And I would love for you to, to talk about uh, a little bit more about how you address the question of agency for David Drake as he was an enslaved um, person. Yeah. So, and, and uh, yes, yeah, agency has over his production, over his, um, his creation. So how do you address that? Yeah, there are two questions there. I'll say the first one about multidisciplinarity is that this work just can't be done without it. And so, and, and I mean that in a very practical sense that archaeologists are important to this work, anthropologists, historians, uh, ceramicists, artists are important to understanding how this material was made. It's it, it For any kind of understanding that would be meaningful for me, I have to approach it from a multidisciplinary standpoint. And and leave, the, this This points a little bit to the, some of the things I was talking about before, to diffuse and disperse the authority over this material across a wide um, range of, of disciplines and, and then engage in that way. So that, that's the part about multidisciplinarity, which I think is absolutely essential. The questions around agency for enslaved people and for people who are working under systems of, extre of extreme duress, this isn't peculiar to enslaved people's but in some ways it's it's marked in a special way. Those questions aren't, um, they aren't simple to answer except to say that everything that I've learned and everything that I've studied about American slavery makes me confident and clear about the fact that they that enslaved people were full human beings and they experienced the full gamut of emotions they are complicated. Enslaved people operate in the past in ways that frustrate me. I'm often frustrated at some of the things they do. I'm inspired by some of the things they do. I'm surprised by some of their reactions. I still can't explain some of the things that happened under the system. They are an incredibly rich set of human beings as any set of human beings would be. And so in trying to approach questions of agency or power or resistance or even artistry, even questions around artistry are complicated and messy. And I just, I just stay there. I just kind of stay in the mess without having to have clean answers and clean lines all the time. Um, I find people fascinating. I find people in the past especially fascinating. Um, and I've never been disappointed in my close readings of history on that, on that point in particular. We have a question from the audience, um, from our president, actually. She was wondering mm -hmm. if you can tell us a little bit more about um, how, Dave, oh, if we know how David Drake learned how to read and write. Yeah, we, there are, there are suppositions, um, but we don't have a clear sense of how this happened. Um, we do know that he was working in and around uh, printer shops at certain points of his life, and he may have, he certainly was close to the worlds of literacy and, and literature in that um, in that sense, he may have um, assumed some learning or, or, or been trained in some way or what have you, but we don't have clear answers about how he um, learned to read. In most cases, for this, I, I would kind of defer to the larger writerly tradition of, of African-Americans in the 19th century. In most cases, people learn to read and write by happenstance that it was a difficult um, process that that proceeded over, in most cases, long periods of time before they develop real um, efficiencies in, in reading and writing. Um, which leads me to, to another question I wanted to address, um, this issue of speculation, the fact that there is uh, so much, um, so much uh, to learn about uh, yeah. the old Edgefield district and also some because of the history of erasure and, and neglect. and. Um, and so I was wondering, how do you write history when you have so much uh, gaps and so many gaps? And also um, thinking about your last uh, part of your presentation and and, um, and your collaboration with artists, um, how they might also uh, be uh, the one who can help us fill the gap um, uh, with an approach that is maybe more uh, materialistic and uh, also spiritual. So yeah, see if you we can end on that. 
Yeah, you know, I would say that the most important, this is certainly true for the history of enslaved peoples, the most important historical gap has been the lack of attention. That, mm -hmm. that once we turn to this, these materials, once we take them seriously, once we bring them into the kind of toolkit, it turns out we know a lot more than we thought we did. And the more attention and more historical research that's applied to a place, the more attention we give to it, the more we learn. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we know more about the people who we attend to most. And we know the least about the people who we attend to the least. And so I've, I'm never um, terribly worried really about gaps in the archive or uh, in, in historical sources or, or that type of thing, because that is true. Those things, those gaps, those historical gaps are true even for the people to whom we've offered a lot of our attention. And we offer, when we offer a lot of our attention to historical spaces that haven't given us a lot of historical resources to draw on, we still learn a lot about them. So I'm not worried about that. I'm more interested in us and our attention and our value, our, our valuing this material and this history. And you, and you think, and, and artists, contemporary artists have been part of this uh, renewed interest also. Yes, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And, and there's something about, there's something about the way that artists, artists convene with this material, with this historical material, that, that is a, a lesson for, for me. And also something about the ways that artists, uh, inherit ways of knowing sometimes without knowing that they've inherited it. So we've we've had a lot of conversations with contemporary artists who've been doing things in ways that are consistent with Edgefield practice, not necessarily consciously engaging their art practice that way, but there's a there's a thing that the body remembers or that traditions remember or that history remembers that comes out in these sparks of inspiration. And that's been really interesting to see and very hard to explain, but difficult, but really interesting to see. Well, that's incredible. I, I wish we could continue this um, this conversation, but we are going to move to our um, next speaker. But thank you so much, Jason, for yes, of course, for um, sharing your research um, with us. Um, so now I will invite uh, Philippe Deloria to um, to present. Uh, let me uh, just introduce Philippe. Hi, Philippe. Welcome. Um, Sorry. Um, so yeah, so uh, Philippe Deloria will uh, present on um, Mary Sully. She was a Dakota largely self-taught artist who drew um, triptych portraits that she called personality prints. Um, Dr. Philippe J. Deloria is of Dakota descent. He's a Leveret Salton Stoll. Sorry, it's a hard word for me. Um, so he's a Leveret Salton Stoll professor of history at Harvard University. He's the author of several books, including Playing Indian from 1998 and um, Becoming Mary Shirley, the World and American Indian Abstract from uh, 2019, and of which we will learn more today. Um, so at this point, I invite you, um, Philippe, to present. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. And what a great a pleasure, Jason, to hear, you know, a, yet another iteration of the fantastic work that you've been doing, you know, around Dave the Potter. I'm actually going to present a little bit on Dave the Potter, um, you know, the, the pot that's here at Harvard um, in about two or three weeks um, to one of my classes. So it's it's always fabulous to catch up with you. Um, so, how uh, mitaku yepi yuhan chante washtea na pe te use pelo Phil Deloria imachi yapi. My name is Phil Deloria. I greet everybody with a good heart. Um, coming to you from uh, the traditional territories of the Massachusetts people um, here in the Boston uh, in the Boston area, and uh, I'm so pleased to be able to join you today and to talk a little bit about about Mary Sully. And I will share my screen also. So um, for a lot of years, as I was sort of presenting this, I, I kept it a secret that Mary Sully was my great aunt. And uh, <laughs> But I think enough people know the secret now that I've begun by just simply confessing it. So, um, so her name was Susan Deloria, and uh, often went by Susie, uh, sort of the diminutive version of that name, uh, and created these things called the personality prints. Um, there are 134 of them. I'm just going to walk through some of the basics um, of this. Uh, 134 of these pieces, they're all triptychs, 
she seems to have started working on these in the late 1920s, um, was quite involved during the 1930s and sort of tapered off in the mid 1940s to the late 19, 1940s. Um, she mostly worked in colored pencil. Uh, there's a little bit of white paint, some gilt, some black ink um, here, but mostly her medium was, um, you know, was colored pencil, um, sort of the medium, I think, of the impoverished person. Um, she spent most of her life with her sister. Um, they uh, were quite transient, um, you know, at times. And, uh, you know, so this um, was a project that she carried with her. Uh, she moved back and forth between New York City and between the reservations in South Dakota. Um, each one of these personality prints is in theory representing the personality of a particular person um, from popular culture. So this character on the right, Harry Emerson Fosdick, was a sort of radio minister, a preacher, and you can see the kind of thematic things that are happening in the top panel, a sort of speaker, radio speaker, with sort of words or kind of icons moving out of the speaker and turning into either a pile of words or perhaps an audience that's listening. And you can see in the second panel how some of those themes are carried forward into a design pattern, then, then the bottom panel, a little smaller, um, ends up being a kind of elaboration on that, oftentimes with native and oftentimes specifically Dakota or Great Plains kinds of inflections. People are often curious about the size of these, so I've just put up the sizes. It's interesting to me that the papers are slightly different between the top and the, the middle panel. Um, and again, you can see sort of the ways that she's playing with the idea of Babe Ruth, the baseball diamond, four bases, a kind of pitcher's mound and converted into a design pattern. And then this really interesting thing at the bottom, a kind of traditional planes uh, sort of thing with medallion kind of figures, um, sort of triangle and diamond figures, and this sort of slit figure ground kind of pattern. I'm just going to show you a few more of these just to give you a sense of, of things and just to quickly describe perhaps who some of the folks are because it does help you make sense. Um, when my mom and I originally opened this box of material in the 1970s, we were quite befuddled by it. Um, when we looked at it again, in 2005, after my father had passed, um, we kind of pulled it out from the, the basement, actually, where it had been hiding. Um, and at that point, you could you could hook up your laptop and actually Google people. So Billy Burke was married to the showman uh, Florence Ziegfeld, um, but is most known for her role as Glinda the Good Witch in The Wizard of Oz. And when you know that bit about who Billy Burke is, suddenly you can see that the top panel, which is the one at the upper left, is representing sort of that bubble that Glinda the Good Witch floats into Munchkin Land uh, um, in, in the film. And you can see her elaborate that in the, the middle panel, which is at the top right. And then the bottom panel, interestingly, right, is sort of riffing, I think, on that floral theme that you can see in the movie in Munchkin Land, where she's taking a kind of woodlands uh, kind of American Indian design for flowers and floral floral kinds of things and sort of elaborating um, elaborating that. She spent a great deal of time actually in, in New York City and uh, was sort of fascinated by the city itself. Um, you can see a couple of these images um, here. Uh, and they tell you a little bit about how she liked to do things, um, looking at Eastern uh, in a large city. You can see that she's, she's very interested in bilateral symmetry or sometimes rotational symmetry. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, um, she would start in the center of the paper and make sort of circular structures that radiated out, or she might start in the center of the paper with a bilateral kind of line and do these intense, oftentimes mirror kind of image drawings. And then sort of taking the color patterns that you can see in the top of the Easter uh, sort of image and elaborating them into kind of a quilty sort of sewing, but with flowing kinds of lines, uh, sort of complicated design pattern, and then a sort of pointillist gesture in the bottom um, panel. So she had a kind of cosmopolitan vision, I think, as she was sort of thinking about the art that she was making. Uh, one of the ones uh, that I think is the most beautiful um, uh, carries forward this kind of figure and ground uh, sort of um, aesthetic that she was interested in. And the Lawrence Tibbet picture here on the right, he was a, a singer, an opera singer, and he had a, a little place, a little cabin in a, in a place in LA called Temescal Canyon. And um, so for the longest time, I read that top panel as kind of a mysterious human trilobite sort of figure with those yellow arms sticking off to the sides and somehow notes but when you reverse the sort of figure ground of that and realize that that is empty space in the space of a canyon, which I was able to do when I discovered that Lawrence Tibbet had this little canyon and he would go and stand on a stage 
an amphitheater stage and sing, and the notes would echo out of the canyon. And suddenly, I realized that that was representing empty space, not positive space. Um, and in fact, the sort of horizontal lines there are sedimentary rocks. And so you can see the ways that she plays back and forth between sort of representational and symbolic and sort of abstracted kinds of um, figurations. And then the middle panel, which is, I think, quite marvelous and mysterious, you know, she seems to be looking at the same scene through a, a sort of camera obscura um, hole, which is repeated many times and it's turned into a note kind of theme and then a kind of kaleidoscope picture there, um, you know, at the bottom. She herself was interested in people who were um, somewhat on the margins, um, who might be considered marginal. Here's um, people who, um, in terms of their professional careers, quite successful, Alfred Lent and Lynn Fontaine, but um, who were in um, uh, partners in what was at that time called a lavender marriage. Uh, and you can see sort of she knows this and she's picking up on this sort of lavender theme of uh, Alfred Lunt. Uh, as, a, as a gay man who's married to Lynn Fontaine as a way of sort of, you know, the, the kind of classic marriage that one saw when people were closeted in that particular kind of way. But you can see their ascent through these stairs to stardom uh, as a result of their marriage. And then at the bottom, it converted into these parflesh boxes of uh, Great Plains Great Plains people. So what's interesting and curious to me is the nature of the production of this art coming out of the 1930s, where she clearly does not fit with any of the sort of classic measures of American art, nor does she fit within the classic sort of measures and parameters of some of the American Indian arts that are emergent, um, you know, at the time. Um, here's three images from the late 1920s, and you can see the kind of Oklahoma style here on the left with Stephen Mopope and the sort of uh, New Mexico style in the middle. And you can see Mary Sully making an abstract image of a tennis player, um, Helen Wills. Um, so she's completely outside of the, con the conventional universe, right, of American Indian arts at the time. She picks up this name, Mary Sully, because she actually has this really interesting genealogy that takes her back to Thomas Sully, uh, portrait painter of the antebellum period, um, well known for the Queen Victoria and many other kinds of images. Um, here's the sort of family tree that kind of tells you a little bit how we're all related. And I just want to point quickly to the person who's sitting right next to Susan Deloria, which is Ella Cara Deloria, her sister, with whom she spent a great deal of time. Ella Deloria uh, worked for Franz Boas at Columbia University, um, back and forth between New York where she did linguistic work and translation work, and then out to the Dakotas, where she did ethnographic kinds of observation and collection. Um, you know, she's regarded as a, a really interesting figure in the history of anthropology. She, this novel, Water Lily, is considered a kind of experimental uh, ethnographic kind of novel. So she's involved in all of these really interesting circles of with anthropology as it's developing, and including with these two figures who become really sort of mentors, um, Ruth Benedict, who is really her, her sort of field supervisor, and Margaret Mead, who picks up after Ruth Benedict dies. And I just wanted to point quickly to Benedict's book, Patterns of Culture from 1934, because in some ways, it feels to me like the culture and personality sort of school that Ruth Benedict and uh, Boaz and Mead are part of is actually reflected in Mary Sully's work. And I've been quite taken with the ways that they may have had a kind of um, conversation back and forth between sort of high gloss American anthropology and this vernacular kind of art that Mary Sully was um, actually developing. So she's got a really interesting visual vocabulary, which um, draws a lot upon Native American women's arts. This is the sort of rawhide painting tradition of the par flesh. And you can see this image down at the bottom right, Cornelia Otis Skinner, a fabulous and interesting actor and storyteller and playwright, um, clearly drawing on this par flesh tradition. Um, quill work, the sort of oldest and most important uh, venerated kind of tradition among Plains Indians, women's arts. Um, you can see her sort of drawing upon these folded quill patterns and representing those. Um, and then beadwork, which because of different technical kinds of challenges, um, you know, produces different kinds of images and iconography. Again, really important to her. I would also point to quilt, quilt work, uh, quilt work rather, um, you know, and to the fact that she served her sister as an ethnographic illustrator. And sometimes you can see the sort of links between ethnographic work that she was doing for her sister in the bottom right and the sort of ways in which that crept into her art um, itself. It's also a really interesting moment um, in which Native women on the Great Plains are sort of, who, who've been operating in a, in a sort of abstract, sort of um, geometric sort of 
uh, symbolic kind of vocabulary for, for a long time, pick up what has been traditionally a men's art of sort of pictographic representation. And this is actually happening a lot at the Standing Rock Reservation, which is where she's coming from and where she ends up growing up. And you can see this making its way into this image, for example, for Eugene Field, um, part and parcel of this sort of a, uh, adoption of the men's pictographic tradition by Native women. I also think it's fun to sort of point to the ways in which she draws upon popular culture, in this case, sort of the cartoon structure. Um, she's also engaged, um, at least I, I believe, in, in part with um, sort of the modernists, um, you know, of the period, not of the 30s so much, but I think looking back into the 20s and perhaps the teens and even the even the aughts, um, it's uh, the Charles DeMuth sort of um, series of poster portraits, um, including the very famous one of uh, William Carlos Williams, I saw the figure five in gold. Curious to me that um, at least two of the same people um, are overlapped in these, these two uh, canons, right? So DeMuth does Gertrude Stein and Mary Sully does Gertrude Stein, um, you know, as, as well. They also both do Eugene O'Neill. Um, so it's a kind of a, a fun sort of way in which to think of that kind of moment of sort of turning caricature and, uh, into art um, and representing people and personalities through um, portraits. Um, I think there's a, a, a politics to this uh, art as well. Um, she, it's interesting for all the different celebrities that she represents um, over the course of these 134 images, there's a number of church images. Um, she's quite invested in the Episcopal church. And there's a few idea images. So she'll do things like jealousy or greed or spring, um, things like that. Um, but I take this image to be sort of a master key into thinking a bit about the politics that underlie uh, this, this project. Um, it's one of three ones, uh, three images that she does that are explicitly representing native life. For the most part, she's quite content in these third panels to sort of evoke native um, aesthetic traditions. Um, but there's at least three, and I just want to close by sort of showing you these and talking through them a little bit. Um, this one, Indian history, uh, where you can see she's adopted this really interesting kind of structure, but she's got clearly a historical narrative here at the bottom, a kind of idyllic native life. Um, I've often sort of said that in the middle of this middle panel, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but it seems like there's a giant thunderstorm, a giant storm moving in, which is, I think, affiliated with this dead stump and this this kind of graphite um, reservation kind of uh, desperate uh, sort of landscape. And what's interesting to me is it, it oftentimes looks like, you know, she's just drawing this fence, but in fact, each one of the things in the second panel up from the bottom or the second sort of section, you know, these are actually discrete uh, sort of sections. So it's got, for me, sort of resonances with some of the muralist kinds of traditions. And then she's got these sort of figures of modern anxiety who are trying to strive, trying to reach up, pointing, and, but noticing also at the bottom of that, that sort of um, area, these sort of bodies of the people who didn't make it. And at the top, this sort of toxic mist and the feet of sort of white colonial America sort of stomping literally on the aspirations of Indian people. So it's quite a pointed uh, sort of message, I think, that shows up here. And I have felt it sort of from an aesthetic position, right? It's it's not crazy to link this to, um, you know, works by, say, Aaron Douglas or Diego Rivera um, during her time in New York and her travels back and forth. Um, uh, it seems like she would have had access to these. And so I think that the resonances are important and powerful. And then in the second one of these images, she, you know, uh, sort of moves to her design pattern or design panel. Um, and in a lot of cases, it seemed like she really was serious about sort of pitching these things as designs, as sort of separating out the second panel and seeing if it could be, you know, sort of sold and adopted as a design. But she's clearly just giving up on that um, here. This was not going to become anybody's wallpaper or tile or linoleum um, in any way. And she's doubling down on the sort of this band of color that uh, is associated with the, that bottom panel. Uh, of native life. And she's doing it by drawing upon sort of really key critical colors, the colors of the par flesh painting, green, red, blue, yellow, but also intensifying the red um, through pinks and purples. And these are in Lakota sort of color philosophy. These are sort of uh, pinks and purples are kind of intensifications of red, a different sort of vibrational kind of moment. But you can see she's holding all of the different um, sort of icons together. 
um, here. And then in the final panel, she'll flip these things on their side and you can see moving in from each edge, she's got the sort of stomping feet represented by those that kind of blue jeaned legs, the sort of figures of modern anxiety represented by the kind of brown diamond triangle pattern, and then the barbed wire of history, really a quite predominant theme. But I think overwritten by this band of color that goes down the middle and which draws upon these colors again of the parfleche painting tradition. So it feels to me like the very affirmative statement about being native in relation to this history. Um, and she does this as well when she turns to the church. Um, you know, uh, it's part of a kind of punning figure ground kind of um, kind of aesthetic that I think she develops. So here, this is this image of Bishop Hare, who was the sort of Episcopal bishop. And uh, you can see she's sort of crafted this dark shadow looming over the traditional uh, Lakota camp, but the shadow actually takes on three different forms. It's a cross, um, but it's also a man, which you can see through the split legs at the bottom. And it's also a bird, I think, as you can see by the sort of ways in which the arms are figured as wings. Um, and Lakota people called him Bishop Hare's the Kaladuzahan, sort of traveling bird. So it's a, it's a Lakota kind of reflection on this uh, sort of church figure. And then the last of these three um, images, the Indian church, uh, which um, I just think is this lovely and interesting kind of image in which she's taking the, um, uh, again, a sort of figure ground kind of um, pun in a way, right, that the those brown triangles figures here look like the flaps of a teepee and these Indian women are all moving into the teepee and moving around the sides and the edges and moving into sort of the light through these sort of sacred rainbows and there's rainbow kinds of themes happening throughout here and if you notice these kind of textile patterns they'll take shape in a whole series of blankets that are kind of hanging in this sort of second panel but so not only is this a functioning as a teepee and these are the teepee flaps the flaps of the lodge um, but they're also uh this purple tells us this is the draping robe of a priest of a missionary priest um who's welcoming um, the church and so it's a mission I, I it's a it's a, a message i think about the importance of indian women um in the church in ways the church sort of shelters and serves them but also i think it's a bit of a colonial critique um, you know, as well. It's not by coincidence. I don't think that the priest has no head um, here. Um, and so some of the transmutations that happen here are really interesting. And this sort of black triangle here, I've sort of argued in the book and is um, her way of reading a bit of a family history. Her father was named uh, Philip J. Delory, but also Tipi Sapa, Black Lodge. And this is a sort of representation of a black tipi um, that's part of a vision that goes in the family. And then you can see she ends this by showing us another quill work kind of pattern. So um, I think there's a, a sort of, I'll just close by sort of mentioning that for all of the cosmopolitanism and the interesting creative visual work that happens in these, there's also a Dakota kind of uh, epistemological position. And it comes out of this, I think, this one letter in which the personality prints are also given this other name, the exhibit of Luta personality prints. And so Luta is a Lakota is a word that refers to red and scarlet, but it's a particular kind of red. There's another uh, another word for red um, that is a, a bit more of an everyday red. This is a kind of formal red. It's a red that shows up in names, but it's also red that is referred to in sort of um, coloring or painting red um, as with porcupine quill work, right? Oftentimes done in red, and you can see a pair of moccasins here in red porcupine quill. Uh, quill work. And I think this has everything to do with sort of her own aesthetic um, of red as an honoring color and this practice of honoring different kinds of people. On the back of this image for George Ade, it says he was very generous in welcoming people to walk around the grounds of his estate in Indiana. Um, so there's oftentimes a very affirmative and positive honoring sort of character, um, you know, to these kinds of things. And I think it pairs with Another way in which she represented herself and was represented as the figure of the, the double woman who was sort of a bit on the margins, like literally on the margins of the camp, um, but who oftentimes would have extraordinary artistic and aesthetic gifts, things that were not just learned through practice, but were gifts of the spirits, um, you know, and it's a quite mysterious and oftentimes sinister is the word that Ella um, her sister used to describe this particular kind of form. Um, so these images, um, 
I'm happy to report have sort of started to make their way out into the world. Um, I've thought of her in, as the sort of Indian version of Hilma of Clint, uh, or perhaps, um, uh, yeah, well, I, I, won't, I won't go further on that, but um, you can see a couple of these images as they were uh, framed as part of the Hearts of Our People exhibit that opened at the Minneapolis Institute of Art and traveled to a couple other different kinds of shows and places. So. Um, uh, thanks for taking time to, to listen uh, and, uh, you know, to this work. I've become quite enamored um, with it over the years. As Jason mentioned, the sort of emotional response that we might have to some of this art I, too, have had. I was very reluctant to put this into um, art storage. I carried it with me for a long time and would take it out and look at it kind of a lot. I just really, really love it, and I hope that, um, that you enjoy it as well. Thank you, Philip, for this uh, excellent presentation. But yes, definitely we are. I mean, I am also very taken by by the work, and I thank you for excavating the the work of of uh, Mary Sully and making it public to us. It's um, yeah, it's really such a powerful um, powerful work um, that arrests us um, to to uh, refer to a word that Jason was also. Um, using earlier um you know the, the it, we were i was particularly interested in having you in in for this new edition of the of the uncommon artist lecture as our museum um also collects and studies a lot of artists uh, who were working in in condition that were quite close to Mary Sully's condition um working in isolation um outside the academic and also the art market uh, sometimes uh, some of the work have never been shown, shown publicly before being studied and collected by the medium. So, so this, this status of uh, anonymity of the work, I would love for you maybe to talk about the challenges of approaching a work that was um, hidden so for so long, for so so, so much uh, time, and um, and what kind of um, approach do, did you have? Well. Um... You know, I mean, it, it was challenging in multiple ways, right? Because there's a family kind of um, uh, sort of dimension to this. And so, you know, you end up writing about your own family, which is always somewhat challenging. Um, and there's, you're, you're a, not a disinterested party, right? In that, in that sort of sense. Um, so I guess part of my strategy has been, I mean, one of the things that um, I've tried to do is to sort of retool myself as a, you know, kind of person who could actually be in conversation with art history. Um, I'm not an art historian. Um, and part of that has been sort of like learning, you know, um, the dimensions of just doing a formal analysis, right? Form was so important to her that sort of formal analysis, um, it it's, has felt to me is really important, but also then the kind of historical contextualization, particularly around the challenges to her sort of psychological and mental health, um, which were a kind of key part of her life. Um, you know, she's quite functional, but um, uh, she was, you know, she very, very shy. She retreated to a room. She did not have a, a very robust sort of social uh, kind of network. So in addition to sort of her own isolation, um, you know, structurally, she also was personally and psychologically, um, you know, isolated. So, you know, so there was those things. And, and, and then I think sort of for me, the other challenge was um, simply thinking about how to contextualize her. Um, you know, it's very tempting to sort of frame her as an outsider artist when one thought about, for example, some of the psychological challenges. But, you know, she clearly saw herself. I, I don't think she would have seen herself that way. It took me a while to kind of work through that to the conclusion that, no, actually, she did see herself as an artist. And I see some questions kind of uh, popping up about sort of where she thought she might show her works. As far as I can tell, she showed she was able to show them three times. And that's it. And and two of those times were in um, Indian schools, um, the Flandau School. Uh, school and the Pipestone Indian School. And, and it's, these things have sort of felt sad to me, right? That sort of displays that were hung up in the cafeteria. She taped the works together um, in order to sort of hang them and display them. Um, there seems to have been a third sort of showing of them to the uh, a, a women's club in Milwaukee. Um, you know, this is the evidence for these things are a little, a little tentative. Um, but uh, you know, so so her own practices of display were um, were were really quite minimal. And I saw one other question, and I'll just quickly address it, which is that she did attach labels to the bottoms of these, and uh, sometimes she wrote the names of the people in pencil, um, either on the front or the back of the panel. So 
almost all of them except seven um, actually are um, pretty easily named. But there are seven which are quite mysterious. She also left behind a list from, I think, 1938 um, that had uh, sort of... 28 images shy of the 134 total. Um, and there's some images on there that just don't seem to match the unidentified ones. So there's J. Edgar Hoover. Where is he? He's not here, right? Igor Sikorsky, the inventor of the helicopter. He's not here. Um, Marian Anderson, she's not here. So there's there's some that are either missing or, or sort of, you know, who knows? Who knows how to think about them? Yes, I, I mean, what was... Um... I think it's really interesting. It's uh, also, again, it's really interdisciplinary in the approach you, you took for understanding the work. Like, as you said, you use psychology, uh, art, art history, history. And also what I think uh, was for me really um, engaging and interesting, it's also your engagement with Dakota epistemologies. Um, I would love for you maybe to talk a little bit more about how um, the engaging with uh, this uh, epistemology helps you understand the work and maybe giving you more like how it relates to you and, um, and, and today. You know, it's one of the most important things I think about my interpretation, you know, here after taking her through many, many different kinds of contexts, right? Modernist art, uh, you know, uh, Native American art, um, the psychological context, the political context, um, you know, the traveling context, they were moving around all the time. You know, um, I really tried to end the book by sort of thinking more about her as a Dakota artist in particular. And the two sort of tropes that I closed on, you know, are really sort of key to that. Thinking about um, this double woman kind of epistemology. And there's a very famous article in Art History by Janet Burlow um, from some years ago, sort of dreaming of double woman, where she takes the figure of double woman as a kind of way of thinking about Native American women involved in aesthetic production. Um, and I wanted to sort of like build on what what Janet had done and sort of backtrack a bit into the ethnography. And for me, what's really interesting is that Ella herself, Ella Deloria, her Susie's sister, had actually done some ethnographic work on the double woman. And so there's four or five different accounts that Ella had had about what it meant to be in this double woman circumstance. And it's it's quite complicated um, and, and mysterious. Really, Ella, Ella keeps using this word, it's mysterious. People don't talk about this anymore. It used to be a thing, it's not really a thing anymore. There's a ceremony, that, that picture that you saw of two women sort of holding this kind of object tied with string that used to be a ceremonial kind of thing in which they would run around the camp and they would laugh hysterically and they would hit each other with these purses. And um, and, and the double woman was figured as being either sort of um, perhaps on the edge of the camp circle because of sexual promiscuity or because of this kind of artistic gift that was such a all-consuming thing that like she couldn't really actually focus or be part of a social group. So the art was like just so consuming, um, but so magical, right? So gifted. Um, and so part of the, actually in the family thing, her her grandmother, Susan Pehan Dutuan was um, said to be a double woman, right? To have had this double woman dream. So thinking about those things, both in the family historical kind of sense, I mean, on the one hand, she's like, I'm going to take Alfred Sully's or Thomas Sully's name and make it as part of my own arts, you know, arts name in order to sort of lay claim to this, this practice. And in fact, you know, she's echoing what Thomas Sully is doing, right? He's painting, he's the one, he's painting the first generation of American and, you know, Atlantic celebrities in, in effect. And she's painting, you know, a generation of mass media celebrities, right? A hundred years later. So, you know, they're not actually that far apart, but she's also not that far apart from her grandmother in terms of thinking about these Lakota kinds of epistemologies. And, and so that's the that's in some ways the complicated version of the Dakota epistemological position. And the less complicated, but I think equally important part is the part about Luta and honoring and quill work and sort of being in a quill working kind of tradition, right? Of the sort of this is the highest art, right, for Plains Indian women. And and I think she's sort of taking and translating quill work and translating the sort of use of red, redness, which is just very, very important um, and, and sort of making it part of a new aesthetic kind of practice. It, it, it looks like it was, this work was also very experimental for you as you had to research um, new forms of making history. And I, I, I would love for you maybe to talk about how you use all these different methodology to, to study. Mary Sully and how it was also maybe received by by historians. Um, I know that uh, you kind of opening new possibilities of looking at at, at the art and especially the question of modernism. So 
um, yeah, I was I was wondering also your book being personal and not personal. So how um, how did you feel like this book and this research fit into the history historical discipline? Yeah, it, it's I mean I tried to make it as solidly historical as you know as I could, but but it also required I mean as Jason was saying it required you know being willing to move into the speculative mode right and to use speculative language about a number of a number of things and I feel like that's entirely legitimate for people who are practicing history right as long as we sort of say that we're working off speculation that has worked off of deductive kinds of logics and off of empirical evidence, right? We're not just making stuff up, although I have been known to do that. Um, I'm, I'm working on a project right now where I have um, a native person guiding Walter Benjamin over the Pyrenees on the last day of his life, which is completely and totally speculative. Uh, but if not uh, critical fabulation or indeed magical realism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, but I've always been quite willing to do that, right, to think about the ways in which, like, historically grounded work could move into the speculative mode, and I think if we're taking interdisciplinarity seriously, this is one of the cross-cutting factors, right, to thinking in an interdisciplinary kind of way. We aim to sort of be interdisciplinary scholars who kind of master two disciplines, but when we move into multidisciplinary, from inter into multidisciplinary kinds of things, we can't actually master all these disciplines. We rely upon, you know, the works of others and the shoulders of others that were, you know, were, who were carrying us. Um, but I think it is, if we're going to do this in an interesting kind of way, sort of being open to the speculative mode, um, you know, feels important to me. And it's, uh, you know if we're thinking about an old school sort of picture of history, it requires a certain amount of courage you know, or foolhardiness, right, you know, to, to do it. But I found most of my historically inclined colleagues have been pretty willing to go along with me, um, you know, on this little journey. As they should. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I think we have to um, to end here, but we will see you in, in, in a very, in very, very soon for the final conversation. Thank you again. Um, so now I will invite um, our final speaker, Tima Junghaus, who is uh, calling us from um, Budapest. I hope everything is okay there. Um, it's, pretty, it's a little late for you. Um, before uh, Timea starts, uh, let me uh, say a few words about her accomplishments. So Dr. Timea Junghaus is an art historian, contemporary art curator, and a Roma activist. She is today the executive director of the European Roma Institute for Arts and Culture. Her cultural works um, include Paradise Lost, the first Roma pavilion at the 52nd Venice Contemporary Art Biennial in 2007. Um, thank you so much, uh, Timea, for joining us. And uh, I will um, invite you to present now. Thank you, uh, Matilda, for the introduction. Uh, I also would like to start with a few introductory statements. Um, I, of course, would like to thank uh, the American Folk Art Museum's invitation. It's a privilege to contribute to the and here Blanchard Uncommon Artists Lecture Series. Uh, and I also thank the kind introduction by Mr. Monty Blanchard. Uh, for uh, the proposal uh, of the topic on Chaya Stoika's arts, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Matilde walker uh, the museum's curator, and also I thank uh, Richard Ho for the technical support. Um, I, uh, I'm really inspired by, um, by the previous lectures, and it's uh, really wonderful to see how, on how many points we will be able to connect uh, to each other uh, and also how the uh, audience will also find ways to connect our lectures. Uh, and finally, there is one important note I need to make regarding terminology. And, and uh, this is on the word Roma, which I will use throughout my lecture. Uh, Roma uh, is the politically correct term in English language that describes uh, tw more than 20 23 subgroups of the largest minority of Europe. Uh, the politically uh, incorrect uh, words used in the past is actually gypsy. And in England uh, today, the politically incorrect term, the politically correct term for our minority is gypsy, Roma and travelers. 
So it is not enough that the term Roma describes over 23 groups when we are using the Council of Europe for the European definition for the largest uh, European minority. This politically correct term even changes geographically. So in Germany, for example, the politically correct term is Sinti and Roma. So please allow me to use Roma as an umbrella term. Uh, I don't know how many of uh, Roma, uh, uh, how many audience members of Roma origin sit with us today. I hope that uh, I will uh, speak, uh, uh, you know, uh, correctly for all the community. Uh, Andrea Stoika's art. Uh, so uh, I now start the presentation and. Uh, uh, Chaya Stoika, uh, the Austrian writer, poet, and painter of Roma origin, was born in 1933. Uh, the Stoikas were descendants of Lovara Roma, a long line of horse traders who were originally from Hungary but had been living in Austria for centuries. By the 20th century, many Roma had already become many Roma had already become sedentary. Uh, the Stoika family was forced to do so by the Nazi laws that came after the annexation of Austria, the Anschluss of Austria in 1938 and 39. She describes her arrival to the Stoika family in her autobiography. I was born into a family of Vlach Roma who followed a traditional nomadic life. I was the fifth child of my parents who had six children altogether. Near a small village, my mother said, the time has come and in half an hour I came into the world. They bathed me in the cold stream. It was May. They were a lot of gypsies with us and they celebrated my birth for five more days. The next day I was baptized. This is something very important for the Roma. This is the end of the quotation. When Chaya Stoika was eight years old, in 1941, her father was deported to the Dachau concentration camp. He was killed in Schloss Hartheim. When she was 10 in 1943, the, the best of her family was deported. The, most of her the rest of her family was deported to the Auschwitz-Birkenau second concentration camp where her mother and sisters were executed. She was transferred to the forced labor camp of Ravensbrück and Bergenwelsen from Auschwitz. She and her, her uh, four brothers uh, out of five uh, survived the Holocaust. They returned, and this is the place, this was the place of the sixth slide. Uh, uh, this is just for Richard's uh, footnote. Uh, they returned from the camp penniless with their bodies injured and souls wounded. In the artist's own words, and the quotation starts again, when we got out, we were ill, completely ill. Our hearts were wounded, our heads, our souls were ill. Those people should all have been given treatment. Somebody who emerges ill from the camp, whose head hurts and soul bleeds for a father, a sister, a brother, who never came out can only have children that are also wounded in their souls. They come into this world, you see how sweet they are, how beautiful. You raise them and care for them, you kiss them and love them. They grow up, but the fear that was in you flows to the children through the mother's milk. This is the end of the quotation. Chaya Stoika was one of the first advocates for the international recognition of the Roma Holocaust, which was only politically recognized in March 1982, when German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt was the first leading representative of the Federal Republic of Germany, who officially recognized the Nazi genocide of the Sinti and Roma. He declared, uh, quotation starts, the Nazi dictatorship inflicted a grave injustice on the Sinti and Roma. They were persecuted for reasons of race. These crimes constituted an act of genocide." End of quotation. Even today, we are learning the historical fact that the Holocaust had 1.5 million Roma victims as well, and more than 500,000 Roma people were murdered by the National Socialists. 
As a survival, Chaya Stoika spoke about the Roma Holocaust history that was very different from the one Roma were taught at school. She told the stories of escapes, uprisings, heroes who hid and fought for others, Roma who participated in the partisan movements. The story she told was a story of Roma agency and not a story of Roma victimhood. Her art contributed largely to the understanding of Roma history, cultural history, and to the institutionalization and canonization of the notion of Roma contemporary art. This process started in the second part of the 20th century, creative Roma writers, artists, and film directors making self-representations were finally allowed into the mainstream discourse after the first Romanic Congress in 1971. This was the point when Roma visual artists started to claim recognition as a group. Until this time, Roma production Roma productions were represented as not being the work of individual authors, but rather as collective facts of nature, which only became concrete representations when they, are, they were in some way presented by an art collector, anthropologist, or folklorist. Until the late 1970s, the support of the creative activity of of uh, artists of Roma has been provided by minority institutions and admirers, admirers of outsider arts and naive paintings. This has changed and Acea Stoika significantly contributed to the change in this matter. Acea Stoika was a pioneer, one of the first Roma thinkers and artists to focus on the analysis or description of the mentality of non-Roma, or in other words, the whiteness or majority, and its racism, nationalism, and anti-Gypsyism. In Stoika's art, Roma contemporary art has the potential to innovatively shed light precisely on the on the perpetuation of the kind of asymmetry that has marred the critical analysis of racial, ethnic formation and cultural practice where the majority white position remained unexamined, unqualified, essential, homogeneous, seemingly self-fashioned and unmarked by history or practice. Her art demonstrates that Roma art contributes to the excavation of the foundations of all racial formations and cultural positionings. It can resituate the majority or whiteness from its unspoken status. It can make oppressions visible by asserting their normalcy and transparency. Uh, Chaya Stoika died in 2013 and her legacy includes over a thousand drawings and paintings. It was not until the age of 54 that she embarked on a great work of memory, first uh, uh, through writing, then poetry, soon after through drawing and painting. Uh, she produced uh, artworks between 1988 and 2013, and her oeuvre may be grouped into specific themes that present her life, also they were not made in, in a chronological order. The many works in this rich oeuvre enable us to grasp the twists and turns of the memory process, with its constructions, deconstructions, and reconstructions reflecting numerous standpoints, uh, sometimes a 10 year old girl's memories uh, cohabiting with suddenly re-emerging uh, repressed images and their analysis by the creative adult. The childhood memory of the horse-drawn caravan or wooden cabin is a returning theme in her works. Six, uh, she often uh, depicted the, the caravan interior and her family life. We see her in idyllic uh, uh, surroundings, in harmony with nature, giving away uh, other details about the Roma everyday life, the fire, the music, the gatherings. Stoika celebrates this traveling uh, uh, and the countryside uh, and the clan or family-based lifestyle. The memory uh, of the Roma Holocaust in Chaya Stoika's art emerges without the constraint of the taboos and prohibitions related to the presentation and representation of the Roma Holocaust. This is the second and largest uh, uh, theme in the oeuvre. She depicts the humiliation of the naked bodies 
the violence and the machinery of death of the concentration camps. Her graphic uh, series have returning uh, uh, iconographic elements, which enable us to better attribute to the series, to the to better attribute the series to the artist and more specifically to the early ink series uh, in her art. These iconographical details include the boots and stitch-like linings which connect the which connect the works to Stoika's stay in the Ravensbrück forced labor camp, where she was working 20-hour shifts in the military leather boots making part of the factory. Uh, the sewing stitches and the barbed wire lines are often repeated details in these artworks. The ravens, birds, are also frequent in these uh, graphics and uh, the birds are also the symbol of the free and traveling Roma people, which symbol must have gained even deeper significance in her captivity. Stoika's art dissolves one of the major semiotic problem, problems related to the representation of the Holocaust, or more precisely, the Roma Holocaust, namely that the Holocaust in all its uniqueness and extremity is unrepresentable. This general semiotic problem confronts not so much the historians of the Holocaust or artists and writers, but the survivors who often share a basic incapacity to express or narrate their past experiences. Jaya Stoika's oil paintings take effect exactly against the usual aesthetic strategies of beauty, pleasure, or a certain liberation from the pain. In her paintings, uh, uh, she reduced the artistic, in her paintings, reduced to artistic gestures, monochromatic palettes, blatantly presenting beatings, torturing, killings, or other unspeakably, unspeakable uh, evil. She refuses the denial or forgetting of the Holocaust trauma and instead she surrenders to, moreover, she exposes her audience to the victimhood, trauma and pain of the past. In other words, uh, in other words of the Holocaust victims experience in order to reenact, understand and to learn it or learn to live with it. This artistic attitude concurs with uh, Adorno's famous dictum to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. And this corrodes even the knowledge of why it has become impossible to write poetry today. This is the end of the Adorno a quote. Chaya Stoika attempts new representation modes that resemble of Saul Friedlander's historian's suggestion for a new aesthetics, which avoids the transgressions of meaning. Not all her works are based on a specific personal experience. Some experience, some refer to places or incidents which she heard or learned about after the Holocaust. I show on slide 17, the Dachau concentration camp and also Cycl Cyclone B, uh, the final liquidation. And these are two abstract works. In her aesthetics, rising out of her Holocaust memory, the camp has a central character. It is mentioned as the place, the black hole, the locus diabolicum, as as she says with her own words, even that is scared of Auschwitz. This is a place without interpretational signs which exists, but is ungraspable. In Chaostoika's memory, it is the place where even the innocence of a child is lost. lost. What is most incomprehensible in her reminiscence is that the proximity of violent death is such a natural knowledge for the children of the camps. She quotes from her biographical uh, writing, the crematory was in front of us. The chimney was smoking day and night, but my mother kept telling me, never talk about this Jaya. Do not talk to anyone about this crematory. Say it is a bakery and they are baking bread for us every day. Another strategy is the reduction of her color, pal color palette, as I mentioned before, to place deeper emphasis on the artistic gestures. The paintings are often monochromatic, gray or dark, with only a violent splash of red injected. The artistic gestures are visibly impassioned, fast and extorted, 
uh, artistic gesticulations, which transfer the internal voltage of the artist to the viewers. This intensively increases the impact of the binary oppositions, such as shade and light, soldier and victim, oppressor and Roma, like in the work of the Even That series. The technique of using um, uh, monochromatic color screen also aids the insinuation of art and of nature into a reconstructed past as a retroactive or self-reflexive sign of the world outside and after the camp. This is also how the black and white reduction became the theme of the documentary's genre. For example, uh, just to mention two uh, examples, Alan, uh, Alain uh, Reznet's documentary film Nuit, Nuit et Brouillard from 1955 operate with the same color method or the black and white documentary segments in the feature film Schindler's List serves the same aim. Chaya Stoika is completely self-taught. In, 19, uh, in 1986, the artist met the Austrian documentary filmmaker Karin Berger, who played a crucial role in encouraging and revealing Stoika's work, but never interfered with the artist's creative process. Karin Berger made two documentaries about Chaya Stoika, uh, one in 1999, Portrait of a Romney, and in 2005, The Green uh, Grass Beneath. Her autobiographical book, Chaya Stoika's autobiographical book, was published in 1988 with the title We Live in Seclusion, The Memories of a Romney. Romney means a Roma girl. It was one of the first books telling the tragic fate of the Roma and Sinti during the Holocaust from a survival's position. Its significance lies in the way it made the European public awareness about the, the struggle of Roma during the Nazi persecution. Later on in 1992, she published another autobiographical book called uh, Travelers on this word, Reisende of dieser Welt. This is only available in German language. The most comprehensive catalog is published by Lied Ballmann and Matthias Reichelt with the title, Even That is Afraid of Auschwitz. Today, her art has been exhibited throughout Western and Eastern Europe, and uh, in Japan, and even in the United States. Uh, one of her last public speeches included the following important message. Uh, quotation starts, I am afraid that Europe is forgetting its past and that Auschwitz is only sleeping. Anti-Gypsy threats, policies, and actions worry me greatly and make me very sad. If the world does not change now, if the world does not open its doors and windows, if it does not build peace, true peace, so that my great-grandchildren have a chance to live in the world, then I cannot explain why I survived Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, and Ravensbrück. We can better understand the spirit of Chaya Stoika if we revisit her story of survival. She escaped from the labor camp and was hiding in forests and fields even several months after the liberation. She was not aware of the liberation because she was in hiding. She described nature, the planet and her fruits as her saviors and protectors. The artist's personal strategy for healing apart from the artistic methodologies was gardening and spending time with nature. We can see in the documentary about her late years, how she grew a wild garden on her balcony overgrowing on the side of her apartment building in Vienna. I think hers was actually the first vertical garden I've ever seen uh, in my life. Um, uh, it was really a flamboyant garden on a blockhouse uh, building. A significant large part of her oeuvre is presenting this traditional Roma knowledge about being connected to the planet, nature, and using the energies and healing capacity of herbs, plants, and the earth to feel connected to others and the universe. We find large, colorful canvases of fruits, fruit trees, flower fields, or flamboyant bouquets which celebrate life. One of her first monographic uh, and comprehensive exhibitions 
uh, were held in 2004 in Vienna at the Jewish Museum with the title Life. Her life, choosing the fight, choosing healing, survival and resilience, in other words, choosing life, every day with every action stands as a model for many, especially for many women in the vulnerable Roma community. The red poppy flowers, which grow wild in the roadsides, are a symbol of Roma resilience and the returning element in these paintings, but also often appearing in Roma poetry and songs. Jaya Stoika's transformative art and politics catalyzed support for the recognition of the Roma Holocaust for changing school curriculum in Europe, finally teaching the Roma Holocaust. She used her public presence to gain resources for memorial events, research, and for the Roma survivors' engagement in education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timia, for this um, wonderful and um, powerful presentation on Shteya Stoika. Um, also, thank you for ending the presentation on um, on, a, on, a, on the note of um, you know celebrating life, um, as you said uh, to me, that was also in spirit uh, aligned with the spirit of Stacia, Stacia was um, always um, you know thinking about life um, and before death, and uh, and it's such a strong uh, testimonial for all of us um, after seeing also through and all these different um, really um, sad and uh, troubling images. So I, I let you maybe um, everyone on the call also to take a deep breath as um, that's um, really one of the darkest uh, periods in, in Europe. Um, and, uh, and, and also ask um, everyone on the call if they want to share questions or comments um, for this uh, conversation. Um, I, I would like maybe to, maybe we should start with um, one of the, testimonials, last public words of Steya about um, Europe forgetting the past. And I was wondering what, um, how relevant is this testimonial for you today um, as a director of the European Women Institute? Um, and uh, yeah, do are, are, are we Europeans uh, for forgetting the, the past? Um, thank you for the question. Um, yes, uh, I think that Chaya Stoika's oeuvre and also the path uh, that she uh, created for us is extremely important for the European Roma Institute uh, for Arts and Culture. Uh, this is the first transnational uh, uh, cultural institute for the largest minority of Europe. Um, and uh, it is uh, important to say that um, uh, without the cultural turn, uh, you know, fighting for the recognition of this notion of Roma art, uh, and also the importance of including artists of Roma origin into, uh, into uh, uh, contemporary art uh, uh, events and uh, exhibitions, this is really uh, something that Chaya Stoika uh, and her her generation started in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s uh, through their creative practices. And today it is very important for ERIAC that we continue um, this surgery on ourselves. And when I say surgery on ourselves, I don't mean the Roma them, on themselves, but, but all of us doing the surgery on ourselves uh, and also creating uh, the assemblies, uh, these rituals of coming together uh, around arts and culture uh, to make sure that we can preserve and transfer this knowledge. And I'm not just saying the knowledge about the Holocaust or knowledge about cultural history and our greatest artists, but I'm also speaking also uh, about the knowledge uh, 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 that Roma people have about uh, uh, about how to connect uh, to the planet, about our spiritual practices, how to transfer all this to the next generations of not only Roma, but Europeans, and also to the global community for peaceful cohabitation. I must say that ERIAC has done a lot uh, last year to make sure that uh, we connect with majority events 
uh, uh, to feature Roma arts and culture and to bring it to the to the widest possible audience. Uh, for example, uh, Eriak uh, was present at the Venice Biennale with the uh, art of uh, Margot Shatamir Gattas and Eugen Raportoru. So we had for the first time in history, a national pavilion, the Polish pavilion represented by a Roma artist. Uh, we also had Eugen Raportoru in the Roma pavilion. Uh, Roma artists were featured at Manifesta 14, uh, yes. For the first time in history, and Milan Triennale, and most importantly, Chaya Stoika was in the center of Documenta 15, which had a large Roma contribution. So we serve Europe, making sure that the most important minority remain visible and the art is recognized. Yes, and I, that's why I was so excited to have you part of this series is um, that I feel like Shteya uh, Stoika has been mostly um, seen in the in the in the past as, uh, you know, I mean, as a genre of like um, witness art or if, you know, we might refer to witness literature. So about the Holocaust and that you have much uh, a, a much larger perspective on your work, looking at how our work is not only a testimonial work and uh, but also she's making a record of herself of her people of women art and she's opening a new a new path for um women artists and uh, and as you said about documental she was part of a larger network of artists contemporary artists who look at her as uh, pioneering in that sense um, i would love for you maybe to talk about um what path did she really open for women artists in in the present and also how did she uh, you know, combat or like, um, as you said, like um, um, fight against representation or like frame framing that work really connected to ethnography or outside um, outside art framing. Um, yes, uh, Chaya Stoika uh, uh, was the first one of the first artists uh, who did not appear in um, in these uh, education centers as uh, as uh, Philip referred to them cafeteria? She wasn't uh, she wasn't any longer one of these cafeteria uh, exhibitors, uh, but uh, but uh, she aimed to uh, exhibit uh, only when uh, she was invited with respect uh, to a majority art space. And this really repositioned the discourse on uh, Roma art and culture, which was until then understood as um, you know, primitive art. Um, and this has real uh, long art historical roots. Uh, you, you, just a very short footnote on this, that uh, what happened is the Central Eastern and Southern European artists were not able to travel to Africa or Tahiti uh, uh, you know, or Aix-en-Provence to find their primitives, they traveled to the closest Roma settlement, which was 30, 40 kilometers from them. And that's where they found their inspiration for the so-called primitive. So it's natural that when the naive wave came in the 60s in art history, you know, Roma were celebrated as a naive artists and the primitives uh, of these uh, nations. And Chaya Stoika was one of the artists who claimed the recognition of authorship and space. Uh, and also she claimed institutions, uh, not just for uh, art and artistic recognition, but for memorial processes. So she played a huge role, for example, in the erection of the, of the memorial in Berlin has a really long name, a memorial uh, for the murdered Sinti and Roma under National Socialist Regime. Uh, but she was an advocate uh, as, the, as a member of the group called the Romani Elders, the, the wisest seven person of the Roma, global Roma community. Um, I have one more question and then I think I'm going to open up to everyone. Um, so it's a question from the audience uh, from Elizabeth Warren was um, asking if, um, how does she connect to Roma uh, tradition of painting, if there is one, and uh, yeah, if you can maybe give uh, more knowledge about um, the Roman art uh, tradition and history. 
Uh, yes, uh, she, uh, of course, uh, as I said, uh, there, there is uh, a huge, uh, um, there is a huge iconography uh, of small elements uh, that we can see in her paintings uh, that, uh, that uh, circulate knowledge, which is internal knowledge inside the community. Uh, that uh, that the non-Roma might simply understand as a stereotypization, but for us these are very uh, important knowledges. Uh, they had a wooden carriage. Uh, they did have the the habit of sitting around the fire. The campsite, as such, uh, is very much uh, the ritual of gathering, not just the family but other families. The rituals of baptism. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know the importance of family life, uh, the the notion of colors. Uh, you know this is a gigantic topic, uh, but it's also uh, I can also uh, say that uh, um, today there are over uh, you know if I would open my database maybe six seven hundred uh, creative producers of Roma origin on the map of Europe. So we cannot say that they all connect to this iconography or this heritage. Um, uh, uh, we can find, of course, uh, strings uh, uh, that uh, that are um, that are important to all of them. One of these, perhaps, is the politics of reclaiming, reappropriating the Roma body, which. Again, as I said, is the colored body is uh, is the the so-called black body in our regions uh, of Central, Eastern, and Southern Europe. And you are also in the process of um, of making or like creating this uh, Roma MoMA, and uh, which is this idea of like creating uh, your own museum and and uh, genealogy for for the Roma um, artists and 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 um, and makers. Um, yes, thank you, Matilda. Uh, this is very important that uh, all the contribution of what we call as uh, all the contributions of what we call the golden year of Roma art, which was 2022 last year, when Roma artists were really present in the center of all these prestigious uh, uh, art events, biennales. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's happened under the, under the institution uh, in quotations called Roma Moma. Roma Moma is the prefigurative Roma Museum. Uh, without infrastructure and without real space uh, for self-representation, it was important that we call to life a more uh, transgressed uh, space, uh, which started as a, as a think tank, then a critical thinking uh, blog, uh, which is available on the ARIAC website, and it performs um, this institution, the Prefigurative Museum in many European locations, hopefully soon in many US locations because Roma Moma is, is basically the moment uh, when Roma art is included uh, under the roof of existing institutions. Right. So if um, Philippe and Jason can join us for a final conversation, we are running a little bit out of time, so it will be a, a short discussion, but I'm happy to see everyone back on screen. Thank you, everyone, again, for, for being part of this series and this really, really, really grandiose um, uh, new edition. So thank you. Everyone, um, I'm not going to try to make any uh, formal connection between the work because I don't think uh, that will be a very speculative um, attempt. But um, but what can I see? Uh, what connection I can see? And I'm sure you have uh, a lot of comments for each other. But what I can see um, at first uh, when I, I I read all your all your talks today is that also work of these artists are really future looking, and uh, and there are gestures in the past that that takes us, uh, that are like talking to us in the present. And I would love for you maybe to talk about that aspect, this kind of dislocation in time of the work and um, and how, yes, how these artists look so pioneering in their approach um, to material and, and, um, and to their work. If, you, if um, one of you want to start. Well, I'll, I'll start and just say a quick word. I mean, you know, 
one of the ways that I've been trying to think hard about this is, you know, um, there's a story about sort of where indigenous modernism comes from, and it's a sort of masculinist story that starts in the 50s and goes into the 60s in the Institute of American Indian Arts and things like that. And, you know, it's felt to me like even the quandary for me has been an argument that even though nobody saw this work from the 30s, it actually has a futurity that's baked into it that is actually meaningful to what has subsequently developed. And so it's an so it's a sort of almost mystical argument, right? No one actually saw this. You can't actually draw a line of kind of connection. And yet, right, I think it actually, one of the things I've tried to suggest is it represents a kind of cohort, right, of Native American women artists who are experimenting around with this kind of, um, these forms of abstraction and modernism um, well before the more famous men who come, you know, a little bit later. And so the dislocations of time, it feels like whenever we get into a conversation about futurity, we ourselves are anticipating a future moment in which people are able to look back and see the sort of things that we hadn't been able to see in our own present moment, right? The structures of feeling in an aesthetic kind of way that actually become visible, you know, later on, you know, in the, in the future. I'll just say on the, on a similar point, um, a lot of scholars in, in African American history have have started to um, center this concept of black time, which is a way about thinking about the relationship between the past and the present that in some ways brushes the distinctions in a certain way to that that these kind of clean distinctions between the thing that happened in the past and a now and a future are actually not the ways that many black people understand the relationship between the past and the now and the future. And that black time is a way of connecting the cycles and um, and in some ways a kind of um, networks of of connection between the then and the now and the soon to come. Timmy, if you want to add anything, but this idea of how uh, Steya's work, you know, is that is an address to us in the present. I think that uh, I think that I already uh, quoted many of her important messages. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I didn't answer at first. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, this uh, notion of survival, resistance, and resilience, uh, uh, especially for women, which is extremely important in the double minority position of, of women in our community. And I don't know if you have any questions for each other or if I should continue asking you questions, but just, just please interrupt me if you have um, anything you'd like to say about each other's work. Um, um, before you do so, let me also, I, I, th I think there was something that um, I me in all this presentation and that's maybe starting from you, Philippe, uh, and this concept of um, Mary Sully, or I, I don't know if it's a concept, but this description of Mary Sully being odd or interestingly odd. Um, and that's uh, and I think that goes back to, to what we talked about a little earlier, but how uh, she, um, Mary Sully was working in the margins, but still she's uh, very unique in the margins. And, uh, and I feel like that's something really connects with also with David Drake as a potter and also a literary uh, figure and uh, and uh, and Steya who's um, uh, you know doing um, like testimonials but also making an art that speaks for 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 herself and for the people she's she's in so uh, yeah if you if that's something maybe this this term or if if um, if that's come is that something that could work for all the artists and yeah if you have any sense or if also Philip you want to comment on that term you've been using well, it's probably not a very good term. <laughs> it's probably yes, I, I, yes, but it drives me. <laughs> yes, but, you know, I mean, but it is. I, I think it's you know, it's too easy to sort of like set up a center margin kind of dichotomy and sort of like let the margins become a kind of washed out generic kind of thing. And it it does feel like certain forms of specificity, actually, as we're talking about that, are really important, both because of the sort of difference that we can see that invites comparisons, but also because of the, you know, sometimes I think great, but sometimes underappreciated similarities that allow us to sort of move across time and space in ways that, you know, to me are always kind of magical, right? When we find those those kinds of moments, right? Comparison's fun, but connection's better. And, um, you know, so odd may not be the right word to sort of get us there, but I, but I, 
but maybe it's a gesture to a vocabulary, right, that we might continue to develop and share. Anything, uh, Jason, you would like to add or? I know we're running on time, but I was, I was, I was gonna say this, that Philip's use of odd, it just calls to my mind uncanny. You know, there's a kind of uncanniness to some of the figures that, that have been under consideration today that they're, I don't know, there, there's a relationship. There's a kind of linguistic relationship between the odd and the uncanny. I don't know that I could work it out in the next minute or so, but when you said that, that was the first thing that came to my mind. I mean, it also points to the ways that, you know, I mean, that, that you know, queering, for example, you know, has, has taken on a, has sort of rigidified around a kind of non-normative kind of sort of practice. But in fact, to me, you know, the sort of that, that word in its genealogies over the last couple of decades, right, has, has pointed in a similar kind of direction, right, to a more capacious kind of, um, you know, understanding that we might, that, you know, might imagine for the word. Yes, and also there's this, um, this, how they operate, also the fact that they defy, not only defy conventions, but maybe expectations. Um, also this idea of like authenticity as, as part of members of communities that have been framed under, under so many um, language and uh, by white people. So I think maybe there's this idea also, maybe the, I don't know. Um, but um, but yeah, and so to to um, to end, also I have a question about something that we we which came up again um, during the conversation. This idea of your engagement and personal engagement, I think, in your approach to this work, and also the engagement with uh, epistemologies that are uh, non non Western. If if um, if you would like, maybe to talk about that uh, as a final point for this conversation. Um, perhaps uh, uh, I can start. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, an extremely uh, fast process from the 1960s, end of 1960s until today, uh, when the Roma community uh, really uh, uh, conducted a fast decolonial uh, practice, uh, the linking uh, and, uh, and completely um, uh, newly establishing itself from from uh, what has been taught to the Roma, uh, and also this is something that Chaya Stoica pioneered with the uh, uh, with the idea that uh, we cannot teach a Roma Holocaust history, which was exclusively about uh, victimhood, and we cannot uh, speak about the Roma life, which is uh, always victimized. Uh, and she's one of the first uh, to speak about agency. So this courage uh, of a pioneer woman uh, stands as a raw model in front of the following uh, generations. Uh, is she, her, her, her resistance and um, interestingly, her shoes, you know, it's uh, very interesting that Philip is, uh, has inspired me to think about Chaya Stoika's collection of beautiful kitten heels. Um, often red kitten heels. So, uh, you know, she was uh, 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 a grand persona. Uh, you know, she stood, uh, 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 she always controlled, uh, you know, the, to be, she always controlled and directed how she will be perceived. Uh, she did not give uh, up uh, the control of the, of the gaze. Uh, you know, to those who observed her. And I think that there's so much that we could speak about uh, 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 her, uh, her uh, strategies uh, that maybe I just passed the word because we will connect uh, anyway. If one of you wants to, um, to have a final word about um this idea of um, using non-Western epistemologies and uh, and also, um, yes, maybe going out a little bit out of uh, the box in terms of research. Well, you know, in Native American studies, there's a lot of, um, a lot of talk about, you know, indigenous epistemology, um, oftentimes sort of undifferentiated. Um, it's felt to me like sometimes, 
that conversation has not been as productive as it could be um, because the specificities of different kinds of cultures and cultural kinds of practices, as opposed to kind of a generic kind of like native people believe in cyclical time, you know, kind of, I don't, you know, I don't really buy that. Um, native people have, as Jason was saying, super complicated multi-temporalities, right? Which are, you know, not so easily understood and not so easily articulated and not so easily translated into English. And, you know, I mean, so for me, one of the things that's been really important about this is to sort of think about the ways that, you know, I might approach some sort of sense of Dakota epistemology, right, through this art and through the making of it and the practice of it, while at the same time recognizing that, you know, Mary Sully was herself a super complicated subject, you know, in multi-dimensional, multicultural, you know, multi-racial kinds of positions. Um, you know, so so it requires, you know, both a sort of gesture to, you know, what one might think of as traditional epistemological kinds of things, but also what does it look like to imagine people who are operating in a world of commensurability and developing their own kinds of things? What's the epistemology of that, you know, as well, because they're not necessarily the same. So it for me, it does push us into thinking hard about how complicated it is even to use that word. Uh, and to have it, you know, kind of have some validity, like what it takes to like be rigorous about that is, I think, quite daunting, frankly. You've mentioned the concept of translation, which seems to me to be at the, at the heart of some of this. There's certain ways of being or thinking or knowing that have to be translated, but then also certain art practices that have to be, that we're kind of translating into other modes. Even the concept of a self-taught artist or the concept of folk art is somewhere in the heart of that is, is an idea that this is some kind of practice that has to be translated into another kind of practice that is perhaps more conventional or, or what have you. With, with Dave, I, I think that one of the things about his writing, his literary um, um, gestures are that they're so difficult to translate. They're so fugitive in their meaning. And it seems quite intentionally so that they're meant to be a little bit hard to unpack. Yes, please. Just one more move uh, on the epistemic, uh, how in the case of Chaya Stoika, we could see so clearly that the epistemic process, the epistemic developments, development has immediate results in the political and hopefully also in the future in the institutional development and successive achievements as well. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for um, for these these talks, and um, and there is still a lot to learn from, as I as I understand, and uh, and so I'm looking for uh, more of of this uh, type of conversations and um, and also um, presentations on this artist. Um, so thank you, the three of you, uh, for be, for having been part of this series. Uh, it was really wonderful to have you. All um, and as this lecture come to uh, an end, I would like to thank everyone uh, for being here with us uh, for this talk um, and uh, this uh, new edition of the of the lecture.